Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our panel on integrating scholarship and community practice. Uh, I am Dr. Hans Scottmeyer, and I'm a professor in the Social Work and Human Services Department here at Kennesaw. I'm going to be joined by Kathleen Scottmeyer, Dr. Kathleen Scottmeyer, who is a professor in psychology at the University of West Georgia, and Wes Robbins, who is the founder and director of Eternal Strength, which is a community-based agency. The title of our presentation, the other slides withstanding, is uh, Eternal Strength, the Community-Based Application of the Key Principles of Radical Youth Work. And I am going to turn this over to Kathleen Scottmeyer, who couldn't be here because she is teaching, but we're going to play uh, her virtually. I want to start by letting you know that the University of West Georgia's psychology program is unlike most traditional psychology programs. Our program, from the undergraduate program through our PhD program, is rooted in alternative psychologies. As a result, a great deal of Wes's project, which began as his PhD dissertation, springs from some of the concepts and ideas that might not be completely familiar to those of you who are schooled in traditional psychology. What I want to speak to today are two of the frameworks that he picked up as I worked with him as his dissertation advisor, as well as some of the ideas that we gleaned from one of his committee members, Dr. Hans Scottman, who is a professor here at KSU. Hans is going to be elaborating on this in just a bit, but one of the first things that Wes became fascinated with was this notion of radical youth work. His dissertation is focused primarily on issues of addiction, but his interest in looking at addiction from different frameworks and going beyond the traditional thinking and definitions about addiction was inspired by the work he was already doing with young people, first in his private practice and then in what became eternal strength. Now, there's certainly many more philosophies and ideas that we could talk about in this regard, but today I'm going to address two key ideas that I believe frame Wes's project and work at Eternal Spring. Of course, Wes is going to be giving you much more detail about his project when we get to this part of the panel today. As Wes and I talked about his project, I offered him some of my own thinking, along with some things that I had written about the work that I had done with young people. More specifically, I shared an article that I had written on developmental psychology and some of those challenges to developmental psychology. I was considering the notion that perhaps the traditional stages of development might not be the best way to think about the period of what we call adolescence. Perhaps the G. Stanley Hall version of adolescence as a period of strong strife might be a very specifically Western industrial capitalist notion of adolescence. Instead, what if we thought of so-called adolescence as an open liminal space of exploration and experimentation that we might just want to keep open throughout our entire lifespan and not just relegate as a particular phase of life? Perhaps we might actually learn a great deal from the openness of this period of time this border space between childhood and adulthood, where young people are allowed to experiment and open themselves to different kinds of identities, different ways of knowing, different possibilities of sociality, and alternative ways of thinking. In my work, I had suggested that we might want to flatten the hierarchy between young people and adults so that we can let go of this category of adultness and begin to open the phase of youth in such a way that it impacts our entire life. Instead of stages, we might want to think about processes and open ourselves to working together with young people and join them in this liminal space of opportunities to think in different ways. Wes also became very interested in Dr. Scott Meyer's ideas about antipsychiatry. Antipsychiatry was a project in the 1960s and the 1970s that was based on the view that psychiatric treatment was often more damaging than helpful to patients. The movement challenged the unequal power relationship between the patient and the doctor and the highly subjective diagnostic process. They worked toward rethinking diagnosis and treatment and letting go of those categories of patient and psychiatrist by working more collaboratively in the spaces between things and by letting go of the objectification of patients and doing what they could to provide autonomy to those patients. Those are the two key concepts that I believe are underpinning Wes's project, and I'm going to turn this over now to 
Dr. Scott Meyer and Russ Robbins to elaborate on those key ideas. So building on what Kathy has outlined, uh, I want to delineate the key principles of radical youth work as we have developed them over the last 20 years or so. We uh, started with the idea of, in the very first article that we published in 2003, we defined radical youth work as youth and adults working together for common political purpose. What this definition was designed to do was to move the field of practitioners who work with young people away from frameworks that indicated that young people were significantly different from adults and had differing agendas and struggles. Our argument was that as we entered the 21st century, young people and adults had more and more in common in terms of the kinds of struggles they encountered in day-to-day -day living. As a result, we argued that they shared common political purpose, but were largely unable to mobilize collectively because of the socially constructed youth-adult developmental divide. By political, we didn't mean a, so, a uh, particular set of political agendas, but any form of life-affirming actions determined collectively between young people and adults. In order to build a common field of political action, we have proposed, as Kathy has noted, that it's necessary to dismantle developmental hierarchies. We don't mean to imply by this that anyone is exempt from differing states of physical, emotional, and psychological becoming. Instead, we are arguing that any description of these changes that organizes them in linear progression that implies an evolutionary superiority to adulthood is inadequate to the project we have in mind. It is our contention that once adult privilege has been dismantled, there is much higher possibility of engaging youth and adults and collectively acting together in ways that serve all of us. Finally, in our work, we have focused on relationships as the fundamental set of practices for engaging our common struggles emotionally, neurologically, and psychologically. We're not interested in models of psychopathology, diagnosis, or behavioral modification. We see these as inherently hierarchical systems that place young people as objects of clinical gaze and find that's incompatible with the work we are interested in engaging. As a result, we have argued for work based on what we have termed political love or what Rosie Bredotti has termed intimate democracy. For us, political love is any set of relationship that enhances the capacities of everyone involved. And intimate democracy is the day-to-day -day relations of each one of us in encounter with one another. For us, these are the foundational elements of radical youth work, and I'll now turn this over to Wes for one version of how that might look in action. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Kathy. So, yes, um, at Eternal Strength, we are a team of healers, light workers, clinicians, and mentors, but more importantly, we are radical youth workers. We seek to revolutionize community health with our community based relational care, our mutual liberation, and our collective political purpose and pursuits. Eternal strength utilizes what we call our three-tiered approach to community, and we have community involvement, experiential work, and our counseling and psychotherapy. So in our first tier, you can see our community involvement is what we do to focus on youth and adults working together for common political purpose, which as Kathy and Hans spoke about, we're defining as anything that is a life-affirming action collectively sought by youth and adults together. All of our community events, our clubs, our organizations are collectively formed, organized, and operated by youth and adults in collaboration with one another towards a purpose-driven mutual liberation. All formation of groups and interest-based process clubs are collaborative, co-created, and formed. Not only do we allow youth to have a voice, but we look for them to lead and work in unison with adults to co-create our community together hand-in-hand. Some examples that we have are our art group, creative expression lab, magical musical rooms, LaVoy's group, Elements Art Exhibit, Cosmic Lamp Quarterly, Underground Newspapers, Zines. As we move to our second tier, we try and focus on what we call our experiential work, which is really, at essence, an attempt to dismantle the developmental hierarchies that Kathy spoke about through creative expression. 
We are co-creating experiential active engagement with one another at eternal strength. Our collaborative creation and expression in unison is essentially working towards flattening and eventually dissolving the traditional developmental hierarchies that are often seen in mental youth healthcare. We seek to amplify creative life force through experiential work leading to a mutual transformation of youth and adults together. Some examples are our music making, recording, creation, ceramic, screen printing, forge building, fabric, arts, design, poetry, dance, expression, improv, psychodrama based work, and interest led experiential work all around. Our third and final tier that we are grounded in is our relationally based therapeutic care that bridges from humanistic and person-centered origins. We work to create continual and intentional depth relational connection at all costs. Whoops. Whoops to Deezy. Um, we go beyond traditional rapport building. We look to establish deep relational sets and capacities with youth we engage in exchanges and encounters that allow youth and adults to maximize creative possibilities for one another. All relational and therapeutic care is co-collaborative and co-created, and our examples are our continual carving of sacred space to connect at a soul and heart level and work on healing through relationship with one another. In closing, we seek to carve and create a new assemblage of community involvement experiential work and relational counseling to build common political purpose focused on love, trust, connection, and expression, an innovative, productive assemblage that births a new means of expression, a new territorial spatial organization, a new institution, a new behavior, a new realization, a radical youth work. Ta-da. And then I think we can open it up for questions. I'd like to ask myself a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'd say, I don't know if I'd use the, the terminology typical, but I will say in the two years we've been open, we just hit our two year anniversary, the youngest client we've had is eight, oldest is 34, and a wide array of beautiful, incredible human souls on the journey of growth and development. From a clinical lens, if we were to use that, I would say we work with a broad range of mental health challenges. So there may be individuals dealing with and maneuvering addiction, substance abuse, anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicidality. Um, but we really try and shift away from a clinical pathological gaze and look to what is the essence of this beautiful young person and how can we co-collaborate a place of expression with them. Um, so yeah, each human soul is so different and we usually know when it's our people. They kind of align, they're like, yeah, this is the spot for us. Thank you. Where I go? I don't know, you guys want to arm wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go here. Okay. Um, I was gonna ask you, so what inspired you to go into this work? Like, yeah, so it's really, um, it was more of a desperation. Um, so I was very comfortable in private practice. I'd been doing that for five years. My mom has her master's in behavioral analysis. My grandmother's got her EDD in psychology. I was seeing young people and doing a lot of experiential work. And I was noticing that the families that would show up, there was missing um, in the mental health field a space like eternal strength. So there was traditional intensive outpatient programs, partial hospitalization programs, psychiatric hospitals, wilderness therapy, residential treatment, therapeutic boarding schools, and I was watching families cycle through this system and still kind of get to a space where they were struggling and seeking and hungering for something different. So I started to ask the young people that I worked with, I'd just be like, look brother, 
look, it says, if you could go anywhere you wanted and you could do holistic growth, healing work the way that you wanted to do it, what would that look like? And we started to co-collaboratively build eternal strength. So I don't even say that I built it. I built it in a dream in unison with young people. Thank you for that. <laughs> you entered the parking lot. <laughs> yes. I guess that kind of leads to my question. I was going to ask about uh, the strategies that you do to create that uh, comfortable environment for collaboration with youth and adults. And so I guess um, for maybe the new people who enter the space, how is that confidence established that you can like, continue to collaborate? Absolutely. And when you say the new people, you mean like new families, new young people right. coming on board. So we have an 8,500 square foot space, um, full music recording studio, a gym, a ceramics arena, an art arena, um, a huge outdoor space, and we really try and keep it very organic. So we have a 90 minute initial, but people can come through to an open house and kind of see us that way and get an energy and a vibration. But as new families come in, everything is customized. So we try and learn as much as we can about that particular family. And when that young person comes in, that really shifts how we show up to meet that young person. And a good example would be 13 year old young guy, super school resistant, incredible guitarist, parents call and they're like, we think this is the spot. We're gonna have a really hard time getting him there. He agrees to take the drive over, the parents get there, he won't get out of the car. They finally convince him to get out of the car, and I walk up and I'm like, look, we don't even, we're not even gonna talk. I don't wanna hear any shit that you have to say. Let's just go in the studio and make some music. And we do that for an hour, and it just starts to kind of carve a very different relational energetic space that isn't looking to force a young person to do what they may not be ready to do. Does that answer that, kind of? Yes. Cool. Yes. Last question. Okay, last question. This might be like, after working for five years at a place of lens, what gave you that push to like shift it from your perspective? Yeah, and that's not, no, that's not personal at all. And I wear my heart on my sleeve, man. You can ask me anything. Um, I, I wouldn't even say that I was working in private practice through a clinical lens. I would say that I was always doing humanistic, person-centered, relationally-based experiential work with young people in different arenas. And it was just more a desire to build a team and create a larger space and not just have it be me in private practice and expand upon that. And then my work with Kathy, with Hans, um, really helped shape my theoretical understanding and weaving that in in a tapestry to the praxis and how can I continue to kind of build upon and do that. So it all I see it all as a, a tapestry that was working towards something, but it was all connected. Thank you very much.